Today, I want to welcome to the show Rachel Bittacoffer, political strategist, author of the new book, Hit 'em Where It Hurts How to Save Democracy by Beating Republicans at Their Own Game, and Cenk Uger, host of The Young Turks, author of the book Justice is Coming, and also a former candidate for president of the United States. I really appreciate both of you being here. I enter the conversation genuinely agnostic about is the best way to defeat Donald Trump. Joe Biden staying in the race or not. Half my audience is furious because I'm not taking one position. The other half is furious because I'm not taking the other position. I want to learn from the two of you and see if we can get to some kind of answer here. Rachel, let me start with you. Help me make sense of it. Does Biden have a path to victory? Is he the strongest candidate to defeat Donald Trump in November at this point? Yeah, I mean, I'm going to come to the answer from political science background. I used to teach and lecture and research on presidential campaigns, including presidential nomination campaigns. So my focus is really focused on the structural complexity of switching our nominee in July. Um, obviously, if it was a clean slate answer, is Biden our best candidate? Clearly not, right? I mean, I had two uh, strategic objectives for the debate that I thought were both very critical. Number one, the Republicans had used social media effectively over four years to brand him as not all there or whatever, dementia Joe, right? And um, I said he needed to show in the debate that he is perfectly fine. Step one, fail. And then the second thing was that he needed to say the words Project 2025, because the reality that I understand is that almost no Americans that need to know what Project 2025 is know what that is today. And, it, and until we have saturation of average swing voters in the swing states, people who don't read or watch news at all, um, they know what Project 2025 is. We're in dire straits. So I wanted Biden to achieve both of those strategic goals, and he did neither. Right? Um, for me, though, the replace Biden thing is 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 flawed, or at least the premise of it is very very da um, dangerous. Because when you talk about moving the nominee, we have 159 field offices going in these seven swing states. There's 11 field offices operating right now in Virginia, the organizational advantage that the Biden campaign team had through the incumbency advantage was the one thing that like made me sleep at night, understanding that the polling over the summer would not reflect the vast majority of people who are going to vote because they do not pay attention to any politics and will not pay attention to it until after Labor Day. So it is very, you know, the, the answer is, should we have a different nominee? Yes. In a perfect world, we would put a new nominee and everyone has their fill in the blank for that. And if it's not Kamala Harris, like you got big problems, folks, because that's the sitting VP. You don't fit, you don't switch uh, switch over a sitting VP without isolating their voters. And in this case, of course, Kamala is the first female Black president, so or vice president. So it would be a double whammy because it would isolate not just any voter, but it would be the core base voter of the Democratic Party. So it's very complex. The filing deadlines uh, start in August. August first is the first filing deadline. It's for Pennsylvania. So we really only have a couple of weeks to sort it out. By the time the convention happens, most of the filing deadlines will have been passed. So it's something that either changes this week or it really is going to be very complex. All right, let's hear from Jenk. So a few things there, Jenk. Number one, uh, you had previously mentioned to us we were thinking of having this conversation a couple of days from now, and you said, I don't even think Biden will be in the race at that point. I'm curious whether you still feel that. Number two, if there is a replacement, Rachel's saying the only real choice is the vice president, Kamala Harris. Curious whether you agree on that. Feel free to respond to anything Rachel said. Yeah. So let's take it one at a time. So number one, Joe Biden's going to drop out of this race. Uh, the only question is when. And so I need people to focus on how disastrous it gets the later it is. So in a sense, Rachel's right in that it gets harder and harder as we go along, as you hit those deadlines, as you hit the convention. I, past the convention, you think it's not even possible. It is possible, but he would basically have to step down from the presidency, and he will. He will definitely step down at some point. Why? Uh, because, first of all, his numbers are catastrophic. So I appreciate that Rachel's honest and and recognizes that he was a zombie in the debate. He was awful, didn't make a single point that he needed to make against an incredibly weak opponent like Trump. Uh, and so, okay, but 
the debate performance is just the indicator. It's like the tip of the iceberg that lets you know the iceberg is there, but it's not the iceberg. The iceberg is the numbers, uh, but now there's a second iceberg, which is forces the hands of the Democrats, which I'll get to in a second. But the main iceberg is the underlying numbers. Uh, so first of all, his top number is disastrous. New York Times and other places have him at losing by six. Uh, this time in 2020, he was winning by nine. Uh, and he barely won the Electoral College at that point. So that's a 15-point difference. He is a he had a 52% approval rating back then. Right now, he has a 36% approval rating. That's 16-point difference. That is that is insurmountable, totally, uh, literally insurmountable because it's never happened before in American history. No incumbent for any federal office has ever been in the 30s this late in an election cycle and come back to it ever. The best politician that has ever existed has not been able to do it, let alone Joe Biden, let alone Joe Biden in this state. So um, it's over. He's definitely going to lose. So that's point one. And so if you're blue MAGA and you say, hey, I want to go down with the ship and I love leadership and I would rather obey and lose to Trump than defy leadership uh, and have a chance of beating Trump. OK, well, you know, you made that bed and you can lie in it. Uh, but I, unlike a lot of Democrats, actually really, really want to beat Trump. If you really, really want to beat Trump, there's no argument for keeping Biden, none. But now the second iceberg is even more important, David, because uh, the Republicans made one ad and then they stopped because they realized, oh, no, if we keep going, uh, Biden will withdraw. And they desperately want Biden to stay in the race because it's a guarantee victory for them. And not just for Trump, but for all of Congress, because the ad they made was against Bob Casey. And they had Bob Casey hugging Joe Biden and wearing a Biden hat. And they said, how long did Bob Casey know about Joe Biden's condition? But he lied to you, and he keeps lying to you to cover up for Joe Biden. Da, 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 da. Those ads are super effective. They're going to annihilate the Democrats in Congress. They're going to run that ad against every Democratic congressman and every Democratic senator. And it's totally going to work. You know why? Because eight out of 10 Americans think that Joe Biden is not mentally healthy enough to be president. So you're not going to convince eight out of 10 Americans that these people aren't lying to cover up for Joe Biden. They're, because it's not just that it, Joe Biden's incredibly weak and he gets attached to the Democrats, that's already terrible. But it's that they're all part of a cover up while they, pretending and lying to the American people that Joe Biden is mentally healthy when eight out of 10 Americans think that he's not. And if you're a blue MAGA and you go, no, he, I heard from Joe Scarborough, he's a dynamo behind the scenes. And I, I believe he's great. Okay, it doesn't matter what you believe. This is what people have to understand. And this is why I said Trump would win in 2016, even though I hate Trump. You can't judge it from your perspective. If you love Joe Biden, that doesn't matter at all. What matters is, is he going to win or not? What do the majority of Americans think? And now that jury's in, eight out of 10, it's already over. So what, what will happen is if Biden stays as he is, the egomaniac narcissist that he is, and he's the mad king, and he burns down uh, the Democratic Party, at some point, post-convention, for example, they'll realize, oh, now all of our poll numbers are three to five points lower. We're going to lose every purple state, every swing district, and we're going to lose some non-swing districts because now Biden's losing three to six non-swing states. Then they're going to panic. Then they're going to throw Biden overboard. They're going to pay Kamala. And then at that point, you can't just say he's not the candidate anymore. He'd, he would have to step down from the presidency. Then they panic and put in Kamala Harris as the president, and Kamala Harris is the candidate. But by that time, it's probably way, way too late. So pick your poison. If you don't push him out now, you are risking the biggest disaster the Democratic Party has ever seen in our lifetime. Okay, I, Rachel. I uh, for a oh, sorry, while, so I'll get to Kamala Harris in a second. Go ahead. Yeah, so, so Rachel, I mean, weigh in on the math that Jenk is laying out, which is plus nine four years ago, minus six now, 15 point swing. If that's true, it seems ironclad. Yeah, Biden's uh, numbers are absolutely wretched, right? But uh, one thing that Jen didn't touch on that I want to point out is that the fact is I've studied, at, you know, as an empirical political scientist, po uh, presidential campaigns. You don't get a lot of them. It's a pretty small model, right? N34, N36, because so many of them serve 
two terms, but I've still studied it empirically. And, you know, the, the, the fact of the matter is we've never had an ex-former president run against an incumbent president, okay? So some of the things that you see with the Biden numbers are the difference in 2020 and 2024, basically, of incumbency being the in-party versus the out-party. If we were the out-party, I'd be in the Caribbean right now on vacation because it's summer. I wouldn't have to worry. We are definitely going to win. Everything would be great, okay? The, the problem here is, is I want to talk one thing about Jen, what Jenks brought up here, that he he's convinced Joe Biden's going to drop out and that, you know, da, 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 and that, that their effort and effort of some of other people, who, especially the Beltway media, to kind of pound him, pound this narrative, especially this hidden health narrative that's going to be the new birtherism. Um, that's no, 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 wait, uh, no, no, don't say that, Rachel. Well, don't say that. Well, hold on. Let me finish my thought. Thank you. Okay. So, um, you know, with all of that stuff, like we we have to um, we have to remember if Joe Biden doesn't leave office, okay, if we don't get him to quit, if he doesn't disappear, if he doesn't decide, by the way, that he wants to leave and then gift all of the campaign infrastructure, all of the campaign money and all of the machine over to Harris, which is why another reason it has to be Harris then, you know, the people are going to pay is not Joe Biden. Joe Biden doesn't give two hoots if he, if he wins or loses, obviously, right? I mean, he said, oh, as long as I gave it my old college try. That's because Joe Biden, like many of our elites, are going to get on airplanes and fly out of here if Donald Trump wins, okay? It's the rest of us that are going to be here. And so, Sank, Jank, if you're wrong and you can't get him to leave, and he is your only horse, and it is your only thing separating, like we're talking about mass mass deportations of brown people, we're talking about loyalty oaths of Muslims, it's all on Trump's website, laid right out there in his own words, this is what we're going to do, Project 2025 is about how to have the power to ignore the Constitution to do it. These are facts. That's what's coming for our most marginalized community members, Black community, trans community. So given those stakes, what I am personally, at least for me, what I can control is me. I am mission focused. If Joe Biden stops being the nominee, I will work to, to uh, elect whoever the replacement is. But if he is the nominee, I'm not going to try to dig a hole deeper and deeper and deeper by doing the Hillary Clinton pile up that we did in 2016 2.0. Okay? OK, I want to hear from Jenk on that on one, the Hillary Clinton pile up and two, your reaction to what Rachel said about the medical Biden story. Yeah. <clears throat> so first of all, it, I, I jumped in there because don't don't compare eight out of 10 Americans who believe that there's something wrong with Joe Biden's. Mental I'm not saying that that's not true. I conceded that point right in the beginning of my first statement. So that what was the birtherism <laughs> comment? But was... but but here's the thing: what you're talking about is how they're weaponize it. That's all I care about too. And where we liberals, I'm not saying you, but everybody, I everybody else, so for me, <laughs> it feels like is constantly like, oh, Biden's got this, he's got that, we got this, and we got that, and it's gonna kill us. And I all I look at, when I look at the Republican Party right now, especially Donald Trump is I see weakness, weakness, okay? Donald Trump, yes, Joe Biden, America doesn't like Joe Biden, but you know who they really don't like is Donald Trump. So when, you know, Jake, when you're pulling up those approval ratings, you got to pull up Donald Trump's, right? I mean, it's the same thing because it's not the, I mean, in Trump's case, it a little bit more is the man. It's okay. the time period that we're living in. We're living in historic highs of tribalism. All right, I let's let Jenk react to that now that you've clarified, Rachel. OK, so there is no birtherism. He is in mental decline and eight out of 10 Americans are not wrong. So now that we've established that. Uh, so you, you're telling me about all the dangers of Donald Trump uh, and all of his weaknesses. Well, sister, I couldn't agree more. That's why I'm pulling all my hair out and why for the last year, as David knows, I've tried so hard to get a different candidate. Why are we voluntarily losing to this guy? How pathetic is Democratic leadership? That they told us, oh, we're geniuses. Don't worry. Let us anoint. Let us pick. We picked Hillary Clinton. She's guaranteed to beat Donald Trump. Well, no, voters picked Hillary Clinton, dude. Okay. What's that? I wrote a whole book, an academic book on it. The voters yeah. picked Hillary Clinton. Yeah, and yeah. Not yeah. the super delegates. Yeah, okay? yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, all right, look, I've been through this debate 200 times, right? So, mainstream media picked Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden. 
And so they uh, said that she was great. The anointed one, they counted the super delegates before they even voted. They made it seem like she had a huge lead. The DNC laundered money through the states to give it to Hillary Clinton. They scheduled the debates on football nights, uh, very little of them. If you don't think that the DNC wanted Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden to win in 2016 and 2020, you're kidding yourself. No one. Believes. I didn't say that. I'm just saying that at the end of the day, the voters. She yeah, at the end of the day, vote. after you rigged the entire <laughs> process through all the media, and then they got rid of super delegates, and cetera. Bernie still lost. So yeah, yeah. Okay, I don't want to get into the 2016 <laughs> debate. Okay, let's. Well, the I know you is, don't because I got to tell on. you, I'm, I. No, 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 no. Let me speak. Let me speak. Okay. So, bottom line is, in 2016, you guys were wrong. You were wrong. You said Hillary Clinton was, was the a great professor. candidate who was, no, hold on. I, I let you speak. <laughs> the only way you could have any hope here is to keep interrupting me. So in 2016, did Hillary Clinton beat Donald Trump? I said she wouldn't. And I said, please, let's pick a different candidate so we could beat this moron. But you yes. all said, he no. All hey, hey, hold hey, on. Hey, let's hey. let Jenk finish. Let's let Jenk finish his thought. All let's let Jenk finish. He did. Hold I on. want to just remind people that he spent the whole cycle. To you, you'll be able to make that point, Rachel. Like, but let's let's Jenk lay it yeah. out. Every time we say pick a stronger candidate, for God's sake, look at the polling. Bernie was up by 12 points against Trump. I'm not relitigating Bernie. If that's gone. That ship has sailed. And at this point, we're not going to pick a progressive. Those are Biden delegates. They're going to pick an establishment candidate. I'm not here to fight old fights. All I'm saying is Democratic leadership has been wrong all the time. Please snap out of the hypnosis of believing these morons. There's very stupid average people who are like, oh, who pays my checks? Hillary Clinton picked me at the DNC. I will support Hillary Clinton. Joe Biden picked me to run the DNC. I will support Joe Biden. They're in there self-interested you think they can't read a poll you think they can't they don't have eyes and ears they didn't see that debate they're sticking with them not because they want to beat trump but because of their own self-interest joe biden hired all those guys at the dnc the entire campaign would be fired tomorrow if joe biden stepped down and jill biden obviously is a massive egomaniac who thinks she's the president so that his inner circle is a disaster He's the most selfish man I've ever met. He doesn't mind losing democracy on his watch. You think he, he no one in his inner circle understands yeah. that you cannot make a 15 point comeback, that that's never been done in American history. And a guy who refuses to do interviews and can barely campaign is going to do the most miraculous comeback. There's no chance of that. So anyone who's arguing for Biden is arguing for Trump. They're saying, I don't mind if Trump wins. It's not that big a deal to me if Trump wins. When hey, you so see can my, I ask a question now? Can I ask you a question? You, oh, let me just finish this point, and I still haven't gotten the comment. I mean, I've heard and your I, establishment rant. Hold on. Well, you'll ask the question in a moment, Rachel. Jenk, Jenk's wrapping up his thought here. All right. Okay, guys. Uh, you only if you stick with Biden, it is a guaranteed loss. If you go to, to another path, whether it's Kamala Harris or another, don't worry, super establishment, very corporate Democrat. OK, you have an you actually have a chance to beat Donald Trump. If you pick someone other than Kamala Harris, all of a sudden we go from massive underdogs to favorites. We would be favorites. We gain about 10 points. Please don't throw away this election. Please don't put Trump back in charge. Rachel, the one thing you're right about is, look, I'm Muslim. You know, I you wanted to ban all like Muslims it. from the country. <laughs> I hate Trump. I don't know okay. why you want to give the election. Can I talk? Go ahead. All right. Let's let Rachel respond to that. And also, Rachel, time. in your response and take it however you want. Address the 10 point gain claim that Jenk makes as sure. well. Please. I, I'm happy to do that. It's a, it's going to be a lift, guys. It's always going to be a lift. Here's one thing that Jenk has to confront all the polling with the replacement people. Same data. OK, it's the same data. I mean, I've seen poll after poll, Harris, Biden, whoever, Buttigieg, Whitmer, whatever it is, all compared to to Biden's numbers, basically the same. Why? Why? Because it's not about the candidate it's about the brand okay we've got a bad brand and voters are associating that brand with all of our candidates okay so there's that again if i could wave a magic wand and i could put let's say my dream ticket gretchen whitmer and josh shapiro into the nomination thing i would be in the caribbean right now i'd be like woo things are going to be great i don't operate in wouldn't it be great land i operate in reality land okay 
And in reality land, to do that, you have to isolate Joe Biden voters. If you skip Kamala too, you're isolating both the Biden and Kamala base. Good luck organizing and winning because those are the core organizational like gas of the party, okay? I want to wrap around. Why you've been doing media, no offense. I've been working on campaigns and elections. I actually destroyed my whole career to go do that and took a, a massive pay cut, do a lot of my work pro bono. In 2022, this leadership that he just eviscerated as do nothing, terrible leadership, yeah. modified enough of the strategy electorally that we were able to go in and blunt their red wave. It wasn't a miracle, okay? It didn't just happen. It happened because of work like Jamie from Jamie Harrison, from me, from others who are working on the strategy. So it's very easy from the sidelines to be like, don't you just want Trump to win? I have a disabled son, okay? I'm gonna have to flee over the border on foot because I don't have the context of a Young Turk show, okay? <laughs> I have a highly incentivized to win the election. The question is, can you take a nominee in, J in July? July 10th is today. Whip them out, even though you already have the operation going in these fields, in these swing states, and switch him and be in a better position to win. And the answer to that is, I don't know, okay? I know any one of the replacements that are, are discussed, but again, Kamala is the only feasible replacement, would, would eviscerate Donald Trump on the stump. I know that, okay? But they each bring with them their own set of negatives. And perhaps the most important negative is how media behaves. Media is very predictable. That's why I cover it in my book so extensively. If we put a new candidate in, the DC Beltway isn't going to just magically stop. They're going to start hounding that new nominee about whatever it is their weakness is. Okay? <laughs> the conversation is going to increasingly revolve around us. And you know, as I say in the book, Voters are just not that into us, okay? Especially the like the super progressive base. Like we took at the bell curve of humanity, our policies, progressive policies are super popular, climate change, guns, whatever, right? But not things like Gaza, okay? Not things like, um, you know, student loan forgiveness or what have you, right? We are very, very lucky if we can keep the conversation around what Project 2025 means for average Americans, because it's going to affect every single family in this country. I just randomly pointed at a page yesterday, looked it up. What is it? Eviscerates free school lunch for poor kids. Okay? So like, so, you know, this allegation that somehow everyone's sitting in an office in D.C. not caring what's going to happen with the election. I just want to really push back at that. It's very easy on the sidelines to like call in. Trust me, I'm still largely on the sidelines calling in, right? Like do this, do that. It is very easy to, to make those judgments, but I wanna be careful about, you know, it is not going to help us if we spend the next four months ranting about how corrupt the Democratic Party is, the Democratic National Committee is. Every day that you have an audience and you're not using it to freak them out about what's coming from Muslims and immigrants in this country and trans people, then you're doing the country a disservice. Okay? Well, let Jenk address that. And in your yeah. world, Jenk, when is Biden replaced and with whom? Yeah. So there is one thing that uh, Rachel and I agree on. Uh, Whitmer Shapiro would be a terrific ticket, would beat Donald Trump. We're choosing not to beat Donald Trump. We agree on what would be the great ticket. We agree that that ticket would win. We basically agree that Biden has almost no chance of winning. So what are we doing here? This is totally mad. Well, can I just, first, I'm not going to cut you off, but like, just so you know, we do agree on that. But the problem is, is like I'm factoring as a political scientist, knowing how these conventions and nominations and infrastructure operates. I've studied it. I've taught it. I know how much infrastructure goes into the act of turning out the vote. And Sank. Now we know what happens when you when you don't do it right in 2018, when, uh, 2020, when they suspended all the field operations for Democrats and we got hammered down ballot. That's why no organization. So that organization comes like if we get rid of them, it would be one thing if we could wipe it and everyone would be right. happy. But you're going to have people pissed off. So how? Okay, yes, Shapiro and Whitmer are great great ticket until you factor in how they got there. If they get there by pissing off Biden and Kamala voters, you're going to have big problems. All right, Jenk, okay. address that specifically. Okay, yeah, uh, there's a hundred things to address, but yeah. here, here we go. So number one, 
it, you guys make it seem like uh, there's only downsides to the new people. Oh my God, how will they ever get an organization set up? Um, with the same exact organization you have now, the DNC. It's not like the DNC disappears overnight. It's not like those offices disappear overnight. You just put in a new candidate. Uh, and you say, well, that's a little bit of risk. Okay, fine. Oh, oh, they haven't been vetted yet enough. Okay, by the way, that's why you shouldn't just be anointing Kamala Harris. She hasn't been vetted enough. We should actually vet all of our candidates at the convention and pre-convention. Okay, but you say, well, then Gretchen Whitmer, maybe she's got something we don't know. Maybe it's a little bit of risk. So that's easy to say, and it's true. Those are a little bit of risk, except you have to compare it to the alternative, which is maximum risk. If you keep Biden in, we all know that he's got an, I mean, what is it, a 90, 95, 99% chance of losing? Doesn't get any riskier than that. So what are we going to go from a loss to a loss? That's but so that's a mathematical. So, Jenk, you say 99 percent Biden loses. Rachel says it's 50 well, 50. That's you know, what the 538 model said. <laughs> 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 it's, I mean, here's the thing. I like, to bet on it. Here's the thing is that. Oh, I mean, I, I mean, if I had to bet against you in the past, I got to warn you, I would have cleaned up. So. Oh, really? Because I've <laughs> almost never been wrong. So go ahead. Here, let's do it now. You, you sure. Dude. Big talk what do you want to bet? Now. The thousand bucks. I don't have that a lot Joe of Joe Biden's going to quit. You want to bet on that? Because he's okay. not going to quit, dude. And no, all Joe, we're going to do is have... an easy one for you, Rachel. It's a layup. If Joe Biden stays in the race, thousand dollars. I say <laughs> I don't here, have that know, kind of money. I'm I, sorry. I, no, no. And I'll give you I'll give you a huge advantage. I'll give you a huge advantage. I say he loses every single swing state. Come on. Take oh, okay, sure. Right? OK, I mean, if, if it's hard to bet something like that, but I'd rather do it for like, you know, a hundred bucks, something I can sure, a hundred bucks, 10 bucks. It doesn't matter. OK, <laughs> I'm a man of the people there. You know, I don't No problem. I just yeah. wanted it to be real enough stakes that it hurts both of us if we lose. So that oh, no, real... here's the thing. Like, I mean, if we lose the race, I mean, this is why I quit my academic job. I had a, I could have gone into think tank world. They wanted to pay me. A, okay. a ludicrous amount of money to come sit in D.C., OK? And instead, I'm like, no, no, no. I got to fix how Democrats election year because we're going to lose in 2022. And well, we didn't. We held all the blue wall states. Okay. We should have lost them all. We held okay. them all. Why? Yeah. Because of good strategy, right? No, and so no, that's here's, not remotely here, true. Saying, why, here's, why was it then? Why was it, Jenk? Here's my yeah. counterpoint. You no, know, hold on. I didn't. I barely got to say anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let Jenk lay it out. Let me address the 80 other things that were brought up. So. Uh, number one, uh, the reason we won in 2022 is uh, because the Republicans are super unpopular and uh, they took women's right to choose away. So but that's not a Joe Biden thing. That's a any de Democrat would do better than the yes. Republicans. In fact, all we're saying is, Jesus, just get to neutral. Just don't have a candidate that's a disaster and you'll very likely win as you did in 2022. It's not the, the strength of the Democratic brand. As you acknowledge yourself, the Democratic brand is bad. But then, Rachel, you don't take the next logical step. How did it get bad? It got bad because the DNC sucks. No, it it's bad. Yes, it is bad because the DNC sucks. You're right. OK, there, it, right. that is why I committed my career to. All right. So we agree on that point. Yeah. 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 OK, so. But it is also bad because we don't answer their propaganda. We they are talking about us. Hold on, Rachel, though. Hold on. Hold on. I'm, I'm monitoring time and I want to make sure Jenk right. gets his time to fully lay this out. He, okay. Address the DNC issue. So, OK, so every time that we say, hey, can you please fix this? Like, for example, paid family leave polls at 84 uh, percent and uh, a huge percentage, about ni over 90 percent of Democrat Democratic voters. And amazingly, even 74 percent of Republican voters want paid family leave. So, Joe Biden, can you please introduce paid family leave? It's a layup. And then you can go down the list. Uh, marijuana legalizations at over 70 percent of uh, raising the minimum wages over two thirds on and on and on. And Biden just sits there and goes, nope, I'm not going to do it because my donors don't want it. And then and then when we say, hey, please, why don't you want to win? Then people like you turn around and say, Oh, you're hurting us. Let us just keep sinking the brand with super unpopular policies for no goddamn reason when the Democratic voters actually have incredibly popular policies. Why don't you fight for them? Why don't you get them passed? If you got two or three of the, the easiest layups in the world passed, or even at this late date just proposed it, 
it would improve your brand. If you had a better candidate, it would improve your brand. But every time we suggest improving the brand, they go, you're being disloyal. You're a heretic. You're helping Trump. You're helping the Republicans. We should stay unpopular and have the worst candidate. How does that help Democrats? So every time you go to help, every time you go to fix, we get blamed. Well, okay, if you're not going to listen to anything we say, then okay, you're going to own the loss. You own 2016. You picked a terrible candidate. We told you, and we were totally right. And I told you a year ago, you talk about the sidelines. You kidding me? I entered the race and I knew that it was desperation. And I told David on this show, I said, of course, the, the chance of winning is microscopic, but I'm so desperate to get a different candidate. If I just do a little bit better or Dean Phillips just does a little bit better, maybe we can get the popular Democratic governors into the race and actually win this thing. I've risked my entire career to try to make sure that we have a better candidate against Trump. And all I've gotten from the establishment guys is grief. Why are you trying to help? I think you're helping Trump by having us pick a better candidate. No, we should pick the worst candidate there is that eight out of 10 Americans think his brain's not even working. And we should just go to the, uh, like lambs to the slaughter. If that is a brilliant idea of democratic leadership, of course our brand sucks because our leaders suck. I need you to stop listening to them. It's like a form of hypnosis. Please trust yourselves if you're a voter. And if your gut is screaming Biden, then okay, go Biden, go Harris, whatever you need. But just make the decision yourself instead of loaning out your brain to the morons at the DNC and the morons at Morning Joe who are always wrong. Just look at our track records. They're always wrong. So last thing is there are no Biden voters that you're going to alienate. There's blue MAGA who's like, oh, I will do what whoever the leader is. But it doesn't matter because the minute you give them a new leader, blue MAGA will just turn to that new leader and go, we are now for the new leader. We are for the new leader. There's no Biden voters. There's, the only Biden voter in the country is Jill Biden. And then we still haven't gotten to Kamala Harris. That's a longer topic. She would be better than Biden. But don't anoint. Stop anointing. Let the strongest Democrat win. What is wrong with the simplest concept in the world? Let the strongest Democrat beat Donald Trump. Let's pick the strongest. Why is this so hard? All right, Rachel, as we this is your your next comment will have to be the last one on this as we're getting to the end of our time. Uh, what talk about what you see in the next week and in the next few months? And, and maybe the one thing I'll go back to Jenk on and I want you to address as well, Rachel, is uh, there are some who say the debate quite literally will make no difference. It It's too far out from the election. It doesn't change the structure of the debate, doesn't change the economy. It doesn't change uh, whether there's incumbency advantage. It doesn't change the fundamentals. How much does the debate matter? I'd love for you to weigh in on and then we'll go back to Jenk to wrap. Yeah, look, I mean, we in our coverage, we hear it all the time, like, oh, the election's winding down or we're coming into the final stretch. Right. And I always point out to people, no, uh, -uh mm -mm. for everybody else, it hasn't started yet and you can't make it start earlier. Right. So the question was, can we? Because we had this unprecedented situation where Trump won't do the real debates. Right. So we end up with this debate in, in June. And I, you know, as a political scientist and forecast, that's what I do. Right. I thought. I'm betting we're going to see significant ratings declines because it's in June. It's not after Labor Day. And that's exactly what we saw. We saw a huge interest drop. Some of that is also powered by the fact that nobody wants Donald Trump. I mean, we talk about how nobody wants Joe Biden, but the truth is nobody wants either of these men, right? It's a, it's a nobody wants election just like in 2016. And that's why that third party vote defection factor could be so determinative in the results, okay? Nobody likes either one of these people in terms of like regular swing voter, normal Americans, okay? So it's the everybody sucks election 2.0, right? And um, I wanna tell Jenk about my book. I don't think he knows about it since he's talking so much about branding. You know, you get a lot out of this book. This is a book that you, you said, like if you come to the DNC and you say you suck and you're doing doing it wrong, they get mad at you. Well, that's literally what my book is. It's, it's, it's not, you know, it's, it's a, this is why we lose. And it's in three parts. Number one, nobody knows nothing. Nobody pays attention to politics and it's all about partisanship. That's what political science has to teach us. Most of the independents included in that. Right. And then number two, how do the Republicans beat us? Well, they understand that assumption about the electorate, that it becomes all narrative and, and Jenks, right? Like they're, the narrative is going to be 
they hid Biden's cognitive stuff, right? That's and they're gonna pound it, pound it, pound it, and that will be the thing that trickles over to these tuned out people. But um, you know, when we think about how they did it, what they do is party discipline, centralization of messaging. And then they prioritize winning over everything else, right? So I, I look in the book, I talk about CRT. I'm like, look, Glenn Youngkin's a business dude. He doesn't give a hoot about CRT. If if you were to ask run Glenn like us would run him, it would be his suits, his suit of strength, business stuff or whatever it is. And he'd talk about those issues and that's how we would run and we'd sell Glenn. Republicans are like, look, Glenn, we know you don't care about public education. You don't even have kids in public education. But if you wedge race in school, you can win. Okay, so this book, uh, Jen, just so you know, I mean, is highly critical of how we've done things and how we've ended up in this position, especially because we have this asymmetry of investment from billionaires, right? They have this map. I mean, they have, we have 500 grassroots youth groups, none of them centralized, all of them re repeating each other. They have Turning Point USA, $80 million annual budget working on youth and, and college voter turnout okay like huge asymmetries and you know the dnc received this book so well they flew me out to their pre-convention meeting bought three copies of the book for each of the state leadership committees hopefully we're going to see a lot of good strategy and i want to close off with this all of these problems that that biden has had are they worse after the debate maybe i don't think so i think 80 percent of americans thought he was too old to run going in 80% of them think he's too old or fun going out. And the only saving grace is who he's running against, right? But it, the, the, um, you know, the fact of the matter is that's the nominee that we have as of today. And every time we are talking about him and his mental health and this and that, and not focused on what's coming with Project 2025 and this MAGA agenda, we're gonna we're gonna be in big big trouble, and you can see this in the hard election data because even with Joe Biden unpopular, okay, and Dobbs Jank is not something that's gonna to wear off. So you were right, and I acknowledge in the book all the strategic shift that we made would have been useless without Dobbs getting overturned because the enthusiasm advantage at that point from us being in party was very low and it equalized and kept us in the game. And the one saving grace I want to point out and just want you to have this information is that through every election since Dobbs, every single one, there has been an eight point overperformance benefit to Democrats. OK, and so we see this world where all the soft data, all the polling data says we're going to lose, we're going to lose and has said that the whole time. And yet we keep going into these face offs in competitive races, even in places like Alabama and wedging Dobbs and winning races that we should not win. Right. So when I tell people like I don't know what's going to happen, that's what I mean, because the polling data says one thing and we just saw what happened with that polling data in France. OK, but the hard data is telling us an entirely different story. All right, Jenk. So feel free to address polling. And also at the end of the day, will the debate have staying power to make a difference here? Yeah. So first, um, I explain on our, on the Young Turks all the time that uh, the reason you're seeing these wild swings from left to right all over the world in Brazil, in France, uh, UK, anywhere here in America, and people can't make sense of it. Uh, do people want left wing or do they want right wing why do they keep changing their minds so dramatically like in the uk giant win for labor historic win uh after brexit isn't that weird right and then in france uh you had this huge the right was supposed to win and then the left won. Uh, and so there's actually an easy explanation it isn't oh the polling is wrong or whatever no it's that whatever is change wins so the the party in France that won was formed a month ago, and they came out of nowhere and won the entire election. And the reason is people are saying, we hate corporate rule. We hate the current system. We, we loathe it. So if you give me change, I'm going to vote for change. So that pattern is so well established all across yep. the world over the last decade. Now, yeah, what are we? <laughs> yeah. And so now what are we doing as Democrats? We're saying we're the no change party. We're going to stick with the establishment candidate who's 81 years old and can't finish a sentence instead of going for change. If we stick with Biden, we're the non-change people. They're going to vote for change. 
on top of every other poll, on top of every historic number there is. It's among the reasons why Biden has no chance. On the other hand, Rachel's right about these big swings because of the abortion issue. Let's take the win. Give me Gretchen Whitmer. Give me Josh Shapiro. Give me Andy Bashir. Give me any generic Democrat. And for God's sake, take the win. Why are we giving away this election? Uh, historians will look back and we'll be befuddled. They'll say, why did they choose to lose? It was the most amazing thing anybody's ever seen. They had a historically terrible candidate and they had perfectly fine candidates they could have gone with. But no, they chose to run straight into the iceberg. So when it comes to the debate, David, people talk about debates like, oh, they're all the same. After Obama got crushed by Romney in the first debate, you know what I said? I said, guys, this doesn't mean a damn thing. Obama's a lock to win. And, and I was right about that. Why? Because they're two normal candidates. Obama had an off night. Obama's incredibly smart. He's going to come back and he's going to do well in the other debates and his record's good and he's a great campaigner. He had terrific hard-hitting ads out. So, you know, whether I agree or disagree with all, all of Obama's policies, he was a terrific candidate. So when you're just talking about winning, right? But now you fast forward to this debate. This debate isn't about just one debate. This debate showed Joe Biden's actual mental health. May, look, uh, mainstream media... And, uh, and Morning Joe is the epicenter of it. They set up this play for you. It's like you go into the theater and they do this play and they keep Joe Biden hidden. He barely does any events. He didn't even do the Super Bowl interview. That's the biggest softball. That's tens of millions of people. And some of them that don't normally vote, every president does the Super Bowl interview. You're giving away tens, yes. maybe hundreds of millions of dollars in free media. So they yeah. kept him hidden. They kept the mad king hidden. And every time Huge he came mistake. out, they, yeah. they pretended that the emperor had clothes on. So at the debate, what happened, David, was the American people saw with their own eyes. The emperor has no clothes. He was exposed. So this thing is over. They're not going to change their mind. Uh, Joe Biden is not going to spring back to life and start doing, where's his press conferences? If I was accused of having mental or cognitive health issues, I would have done a four hour press conference. I would have done 12 of the toughest interviews you've ever seen and I would have crushed them. Any good candidate would. Joe Biden still hasn't done any of those things because he's I, not capable as a of point it. Of clarification, well, listen, no, guys, wanna, uh, Rachel, clarify, but we're Trump way hasn't over done time. An event please. In 12 days and, and Biden's been out the whole time. Mold multiple events every day that's so like, true I that's true and we've sure covered people that. know biden is out very aggressively just not doing the thing that you he's know, not we, doing the things jenk is pointing right. out though that's fair yeah. listen guys okay. we must end uh we could go on another 45 minutes we've been speaking with rachel bittekoffer and jenk uger i so appreciate you guys taking time to talk to me today and to talk to each other thanks so much Thank yep you. thanks for having me and thanks for for, for fighting with me jenk <laughs> You can lock that hundred bucks in, though. I, I can afford that.